Unpacking Mormonism and other religious trauma is meant for educational purposes only. Hey, hello, everybody. Here at Unpacking Mormonism, we are, I'm sorry, I keep looking over at the computer, which is over there. Um, yeah, thank you, Mason. Help me here. <laughs> Gotta watch myself. My mom says that I used to always look in the mirror and stare at myself. I think that's a normal, natural human tendency. That's but <laughs> Interesting. I look and stare at you all the time, too. So oh, nice. maybe it's just you. That's awesome. So we are having some technical difficulties with our equipment. And so we jumped here. We use StreamYard for our video feeds. And because we were having some technical difficulties and our producer isn't um, available right now, we decided to just jump on and do this because I am leaving on Thursday for my first book tour. So by the time you are watching this or seeing this, that'll be old news. That's going to be old news. It'll be good. Um, but yeah, we don't have another time to get this episode recorded until... Um, after I get back from my first book signing tour. So here we are, uh, very casual in our recording studio. And just casual. bear with us. This is one of my best shirts. Yeah? Just kidding. It's really Mormon. Nice. That's a Mormon, <laughs> like, bishop-worthy t-shirt. That's right. I spilled coffee on my boob earlier, but see, that's why nobody can see my boobs. All righty, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mason, for that. All right, so mm. we are going to be talking today um, about the role that the Mormon church places on our men. And I think that one of the things, Mason, that you've brought up several times is that um, it's not just the Mormon church. It was society from yes. from when, you know, just our, our time period. And so a lot of the societal norms have changed, but I don't really feel like the Mormon church's norms have changed on that front. Would you agree with that? Um, I think it's in the, I think they're sort of kind of in the process of changing it. Sort of. <laughs> sort of. Sort I think, I think there's the a process. lot of, I think there's a lot of explicit, explicit messaging out there that is trying that? to change it. Like for instance, uh, I was going to pull out the, uh, the family proclamation to the world. Okay. In the family proclamation to the world, there's a lot of messaging. In fact, I'll let me just pull up what I was talking about here. Um, He's winning in his game, too, by the way. I'm watching here. <laughs> so the family's ordained of God. Marriage between man and woman is essential to his eternal plan. Let's get down here. Successful marriages and families are established and maintained on principles of faith. Where am I looking for? By divine design, fathers are to preside over the home. Mothers are primarily responsible in these sacred responsibilities, fathers and mothers are obligated to help one another as equal partners. Like, I think there's a lot of messaging that is looking for equality, mm -hmm. maybe even more than society in general. But as we're going to talk about today, I think that the implicit messaging maybe hasn't changed very much at all. And so I so when you ask the question, I think that they're on their way to try and change things. But society is on their way to try and change things and has been for quite some time now in looking for equality between the sexes. And yeah, so I think that once again, the church is kind of behind the power curve on that. A couple decades. I think they're a decade. they're trying to change it now, but really they're they're changing after society has changed when well, was the equal rights amendment yeah this reminds me of the um episode we did on internal versus external sources um with you know with the idea that the church tells us what we're supposed to think or how we're supposed to interpret uh certain pieces of information what's right what's wrong um versus us being able to trust ourselves, our own observations. And I think that this is where men, um, at least in many high demand religions or, and other systems, really end up kind of falling into that. This external source says that this is what defines a quote unquote man, right? And um, it's wrong. It's, it's not, it's just not accurate information. And I think that, you know, feminism 
while is a very good thing, I'm, I'm not going to say that feminism is this bad, evil thing. I mean, I know several prophets of the Mormon church have said that, but I definitely don't agree with that. I think that feminism has helped to raise the awareness needed to bring about more equality. But like a lot of things, you know, you look at a pendulum on, on like an old grandfather right. clock, right? It's swinging like this. And so we used to be way over here where women had very little to no rights. Um, and now we've swung that pendulum all the way over here, where in order for women to gain their rights, we end up tromping on who our men are and what role they are supposed to play. And I have a lot of male clients that come in and, and they're struggling with anxiety and depression because they've lost their role in life. And really what that is, yeah. is that the role is not well-defined you know, it's it's almost like because I no longer have this external source telling me what I'm supposed to do, it leaves a lot of men scrambling. And and you know, the other the other side of that coin is that women are like, well, men are just toxic. And and I hear that a lot. You know, I hear terms toxic masculinity right. and these types of things. And and I would say, you know, I'm not a big fan of patriarchy. You know, I'm going to put the same thing that was it Emily Nagoski that was like patriarchy. <laughs> Emily Andrews' sister. That was the one where they were both. So if you listen to the narrated version, the audible version of it, every time they say patriarchy in the book, one of them goes. <laughs> right. Which <laughs> one is that, like though? That. That's that's the. That is the um, the stressed one. OK, so the burnout book. Burnout. Burnout book. Burnout. And every time they say the word patriarchy, they go. Ugh. Yes. Right. So which I, I agree with them, because I think that there's I think the issue with patriarchy is that it creates that like triangle where the man is at the top. And then there's you're going to have a lot of people who are like, well, no, Jesus is at the top. Well, no, well, wait, Jesus wait. is a man. So I don't know that that really um, point. negates that. Fair. argument. And when you talk about your pendulum, just to to go back to that before you move on. I don't think that we've gone from this side to this side. I think we're in the, <laughs> this man. side right here. <laughs> pendulum, pendulum swinging right. We started over right. here. I don't think we've gone over here because if we've gone over here, it would feel more like a complete reversal. Meaning that over men here, have no men rights. Men have the power and over here, women have the power. And I'm not talking even about rights necessarily, but here, men have the power. If you look back historically at almost all of our written history, mm -hmm. men have the power. And there are biological reasons for that, but men have the power. And even in our society now, we're only getting to the point, we're starting to get to the point where women have some power. Right. They've recognized that they can. And part of that is because we have a more civilized society. In a less civilized society, you, I don't think that you even have the ability to share that power but in our civilized society, I think you do have the ability to share the power. And we're starting to see that. Okay. So I'm going to look up the word power because you used it so many times. <laughs> like if you were writing a book, your editor would be screaming at you right now. But like, what do you mean by the word quote unquote power? Because, well, so, oh, wow. I'm getting all kinds of videos. Yeah. So Brene what Brown, is the definition of power? Possession of control, authority, or influence over others. Right. I think that's the problem with quote unquote power in general is that you have authority and influence over others. So Brene Brown I've calls it two different kinds of power. There's power over and okay. there's power with. Oh, I like that. Okay. And, Go and Brene. I, I cannot <laughs> give that justice in describing it now because I don't remember all the things that she said. Right. But basically I might even be saying power with wrong, but there's power over and there's essentially power with. I don't remember exactly how she described it. Right. But for a long time, society has kind of taught us that the only power that exists is the power over. Mm -hmm. And that that is kind of finite. You can only have power over so many people, so many things, so much right. stuff. Well, like I might want to have power over my toddler in order to right. keep them alive. But then right. as my kiddos turn into teenagers, I no longer want power over them. I want them to start taking their like independence so that they begin yeah. to have power over power themselves with them at that point in time. so that they can govern themselves right. and then as they become adults i i need to like you know declaw right. completely right. in order yeah. to yeah I, I like that and to restate when you're talking about power over mm -hmm. there's a 
finiteness that goes along with that. You only have so much that you control. So the more that you can grab, the more power that you have. But if you're talking about power with, it is not finite. You can have power with a lot of people, a lot of things. And so there's no, yeah, there's no quantitative struggle there because you're quantitative trying quantitative struggle. Well, think of it like, for instance, if you wanted to be the most powerful person in a town or a city, you're going to have to own lots of things, lots of property, the wells, the banks, whatever. Got it. But there's only a certain amount of land or property that you can own Got at it. some point in time that is. It, it's all gathered up. So when you're talking about power with that, that doesn't have the same sort of finite um, restrictions on it. Okay. So speaking about religious norms or like the, 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 because really what you and I were talking about in our planning meeting was <laughs> what did religion define Mason's role was in life and how has that, you know, created an emotional wounding in our men because really for, ow, that hurt my ear. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if you, you can hear the pop, throw thump that down. of Mason dropping <laughs> shit all over the place. Well, yeah, like you said, technical difficulties. I don't have much space here, right. so I'm trying to stay in the view. Y'all have, yeah, right, just, have a very beautiful image of like our setup back here, but if you could see behind the camera, it's a dump. It's a mess. It's yeah. a mess. Yes, it is. Okay. So because really, you know, I was So what was the listening, spiritual right, religious I was, messaging? Right. Because I was listening to this thing um, or reading, I don't even remember, reading, listening. Recently, I heard something that said, you know, men aren't toxic, they're wounded. And I was like, yeah, that's absolutely accurate because the men that I'm seeing in client, they don't, in, in clinic. Session, yeah. Right. In clinic, they're not want a few, some of them are. I'm going to be honest. Some of them are. Um, but but for the most part, men don't want to lord over their women. They don't want as much responsibility or, you know, quote unquote, power over people that they're given. Um, it's, you know, they're scrambling just as much as women are like women are like, let me have some of this. And and men are like, you know, I'm so fucking burned out from always having to fulfill these norms that society places and so you know as we continue to fight the societal things i think some of the things that show up in high demand religions and we're again specifically mormonism because that's where our experiential right. expertise is um what are some of the roles mason that you feel that the church gave you that at one time you would have thought this is righteous this is what god wants for me in order for us to obtain Right. eternal salvation and that you know eternal happiness this like glorious beautiful thing what are some of those roles that you've identified that you're like whoa now that you're on the other side going yeah that was not as healthy as i thought it was uh, yeah well there's quite a few let me start with just uh, i have just one scripture really and it comes from the Doctrine and Covenants section 121, which I still think is a very powerful set of scriptures, mm -hmm. because for the most part, the explicit message is about men behaving themselves and not lording over. Um, it doesn't say specifically women, but just in general, not okay. lording over Go for it. family. But I want to focus instead on the implicit message that mm -hmm. comes from it. And let me start with Doctrine and Covenants section 121, verse 34. Many that are in the church will remember this, but it says, Behold, there are many called, but few are chosen. And why are they not chosen? Well, let me just explain then what's going to happen for the next 15 verses. God is going to talk about the reasons that people are not chosen. But then let me just, so that's, that's what's coming ahead. Let me back up. The very first line says, Behold, many are called, but few are chosen. And it is, you'll find in further verses, this is talking specifically about priesthood authority. Okay. Which means in the Mormon church, you're talking about men. Right. Which means in the Mormon church, you're talking about men that have the priesthood. Well, if you have the priesthood, you are called and you are chosen. So the implicit message is, I'm special and I am morally superior I think that you can get that from mm -hmm. that message. I don't know that I ever got that. And I don't know that that is an implicit message, but I think you can get it from there. So I don't think that people like my experience with most members of the church aren't that they are consciously thinking I'm morally superior 
over others. And I see this in both men and women. I want to make that abundantly clear. This is not something that I'm saying is exclusive to men in the Mormon church, but that because we're special, because we're the only ones with the truth, um, because we are the God's chosen people, we end up behaving in ways that are morally superior, even when we don't want to, you know, it's, yeah. it's been very interesting as we interact with, you know, mostly family members, because most, <laughs> mostly family, family members are the ones that are the most comfortable telling us where we're wrong. Right. Um, and so as we've interacted, it's been like, no, I'm smarter than you. And you're just trying to tear down what I have. And it's not that they're overtly saying I'm smarter than you. It's not that they're overtly saying I know the truth and you don't. That's not the intent. Actually, there. a lot of it has been them accusing us of acting like we're more, we're smarter. Right, than it's them. the opposite. It's like yeah. you guys think you're smarter than us, but you're not. You're just attacking Again, the us. Message is, and you're, you know, yeah. Satan has gotten a hold of your hearts, yeah. and you're going to hell, and your marriage is doomed. And bleh. right. So talking about that moral superiority, if you're mm-hmm. talking about the church as a whole, membership of the as a whole, if you are raised in an, a society or a group where you believe you have what everybody else needs that gives right. you a degree of moral superiority. And then or, our men. And now if you take that to the men, you and I both have the truth, the truth. Right. So we're both morally but superior. What do I have? Power. Well, and, and not even so much power as that was a good voice, by the way. <laughs> that was, I am, I am critical to that because you can't have the ordinances for salvation without me. I can't have or, anything or without, without a priesthood holder. Right. I'm not allowed to make you decisions can't get baptized without you. Can't you can't have the sacrament. You can't yep. go to the temple. Can't go to the you temple. can't do any of that without priesthood authority, which means, and this goes both ways. You know, it gives me an air. It, it can give me an edge of superiority, but it also gives me an overwhelming sense of responsibility right, because well, you're now dependent on me. And something else that really stands out to me is I can't even get my names on the record of the church without a man because in order to get your name on the record of the church you have to be blessed like even as a newborn baby you have to be blessed or baptized so i have to have men to get in i have to have men to get out like i can't do anything in the mormon church without the approval of somebody with a penis right so men and the power or penis power i'm calling it penis power that's the penis power penis power (laughs) (laughs) the pp it's the PP priestess powder or okay. penis power. Penis power, the PP. So while men or so while <laughs> I women she meant PP for like short for like a little boy's PP. And I was like, dude, PP power just does not sound anywhere near you know, as awesome. PP power would be penis power power, and that's power squared. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> while women get the message that they are not significant, women get right. marginalized, men get told that we're critical. Right. Hang on. That our role is I am basically as a father and a priesthood holder, like for, as a mother, you're responsible for your He's children. The, Henry is the reason I keep, sorry, interact. Squirrel, squirrel, dog, dog. Henry is the reason why I keep looking like I'm sitting more forward towards the camera than you. It's because he has to be touching me. Otherwise he will bark at me. So, but he's like overheating. He's overheating me. And I do not know what's dinging. Keep going. It's your computer. Well, it needs to shut up. <laughs> Oh, um, way to go. Turn off my sound. <laughs> All right, keep going. So anyway, so I get told how, res- how important I am, how responsible I am. And so that can lead to overbearing mm-hmm. or it can lead to overwhelm because we get taught that in the church, you get saved as families. Right. You're responsible as a woman for your children. They're your responsibility. That is very much <laughs> a, a, an implicit explicit message in the church yeah i wouldn't say that's implicit that is explicit but so am i and the implicit message is that i'm also responsible for you and so i get more that i'm responsible for and you know like the idea if you see your parents somebody sees your kids misbehave well that falls on the parents right the judgment goes to the parents um and so in this case if my family is falling apart my eyes for instance like when you left the church that right. falls on me too. Some of my mm-hmm. responsibility. I'm not keeping my wife. I'm not keeping my woman in line. Right. And <laughs> there's some, of, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but there's some of that message there. And so that's one of them. That's the message that's there. Right. 
um, there's this, this concept of success in the church comes with less time for my family. Like if I, if I am being a successful priesthood holder, my callings will gradually get more and more um, demanding as, as right. a bishop. I certainly had less time to be with my family, but that's all um, elitism. That's all progress, quote unquote. Right. So don't go too it's fast. So status. let's make sure that we break some of these down. Cause like I've got all my notes here. So let, let's, I figured you would just stop me. Well, I'm stopping you. Damn it. All right. <laughs> all righty. So, I want to talk about the, let's see what I have on here first. Let's talk first about your role as bishop. We've talked about it a little bit. We talked about, it. it's definitely showing up in my book, Trauma Bonded. Look, see, Trauma Bonded, woohoo. Um, we talked about it there, <laughs> um, which art. was. Um, art. What? God nib. What? It's backward on the screen. Oh, so we is it? it? We didn't mirror, we didn't mirror our cameras. <laughs> <laughs> whatever all righty so it is backwards on the yep. whatever what all else? right hey it says trauma bonded and looks good all righty um no so one of the things that we talked about <coughs> was that um as you became <laughs> more my space is all off <laughs> i'm trying to drink your water rude I don't know where to put all my crap Let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. Diagnose Zeithochdruck. Wir verschreiben ausreichend Zeit für PatientInnen. Herzlich willkommen im Krankenhaus St. Josef Braunau. Jetzt bewerben als Ärztin oder Arzt für Innere Medizin. khbr.at slash karriere. America, we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. At Grand Canyon University, we believe in equal opportunity, and the American dream starts with purpose. To serve others in ways that promote human flourishing and create a ripple effect of transformation for generations to come, find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Private, Christian, affordable. Visit gcu.edu. We'll fix it later for next time or something. It'll be fine. It will. Deal. Oh, you pull out a bench. It will. There you go. It will be Y'all, okay. Mason has to spread out. Like, when he needs space, he needs a lot of it. He has a big wingspan. He's flying. Woo! It's, it's penis power. We're used to spreading. <laughs> okay, this Whereas is, women are used to making themselves this a, small. This is an R-rated um, show hi well Henry. And, and we're talking about implicit, you, we're talking about implicit much. messaging right one of the implicit messages that comes with, with men is i can spread eagle right and women <laughs> cannot i have to crisscross it's it's right. i think almost an implicit message of skirts dresses you have to wear skirts and dresses because it makes you smaller Okay. I've never thought of it that way, but I'm not going to argue with you. I'll let you be right this time. <laughs> okay. Yes. So I'm yeah. done y'all. I'm out of here. Yeah. Good luck. The door's that way. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not letting you know. Um, so anyway, we're having way too much fun looking at ourselves. <laughs> Screamed at it. No. So my point being is that the more elevated, the higher your calling or the more important the role you held in the church. So it was goodness. Other than a couple of years of our marriage, you always served in some sort of presidency or leadership role the entire time you were in the church. So you were either like in the young men's presidency or the elders quorum presidency. Or the bishopric. Or the bishopric. Yep. Yep. Or the stake. Sunday school presidency as well. Stake president. Yeah. Yeah. Stake Sunday school presidency. Sorry. I almost said stake presidency. Yeah. Doesn't work. So that was a stake calling which required me to. Yeah. So stake Sunday school. So you were gone all the time. So I'm going to say starting in 2009, which would have been when you got called to be the executive secretary. And then in mm-hmm. 2010, you got called to be in the bishopric. From mm-hmm. that point forward, you never sat with me in the stance ever. Except for one year. But yes, for the most part. Yes. Oh, that's right. For your year of anesthesia school. The but year of in San Antonio. Yeah. The year in San Antonio. But you me. hardly ever sat in the stands with me then because you were like constantly... So I'm trying to, okay, Henry, I love you. Go away. All right. 
Henry's going to start yapping at us in a minute, but I need a break from him. He seriously is driving me crazy today. Um, love, love our mascot. He's driving me crazy. Um, okay. So other than that, you're in San Antonio. Um, you sat on the stand, mm -hmm. but really what I want to talk about is that because you had the priesthood power and because you were acting in quote unquote, Jesus's name, mm -hmm. you put a lot of effort into being empathetic, into listening in a way that allowed you to respond to the people that you were counseling, like spiritually right. counseling or guiding. Right. Um, that, that was a part of, of your role. But then when you got home, like it went that, that, switch it like turned off it was almost like because you have been quote unquote set apart to act in the savior's name especially as a bishop when you are a judge in israel like i'm i'm quoting you guys just keep watching i'm like yeah, air quoting air quotes going, all, air quotes over going all over the place right but it's because but it's because those were the things that you were told like the external authority said that when you are acting in the role as a bishop, you are basically acting in Jesus's name or God's name. Yeah. Both. Yeah. Yeah. That you were a judge in Israel, that you were supposed that the counsel you were giving came directly from God. And so I feel like because of that, you were very aware and conscious and, and for the most part, intentional in how you approached the members of the church. Um, but then when you got home, that went off and you were not emotionally available to your family. Do you want to speak about that a little bit? Um, so I'm not sure how much of that is from implicit or explicit messaging from the church or religion. Partly Get off because... the implicit, explicit messaging. Let's talk about toxicity and non-toxicity. Oh, I'm sorry. I that think, thinking face is terrifying. I, I think that a good part of toxic masculinity has to do with the messages that we're giving. Okay. Given. So that's, I'm not trying to just harp on that. I'm trying to I just to want to make of... sure we're not like trying to fit. Ev I'm sorry, I just totally interrupted you. Um, <laughs> I want to make sure we're not trying to fit every example into implicit and explicit oh, yeah, messaging. Not at all. Um, so, but what I was, what I was saying was that I'm not sure how much of that comes from the messaging from the church, implicit, explicit, whatever. I'm not sure how much of that comes from that. Part of that is because I haven't really unpacked that. Part of the issue was my inability to be emotionally available for you. Mostly you, uh, even for the kids, I was a little bit more emotionally available. And I think it was because a similar reason to why I was more emotionally available to members when they came to me, when members come to the bishop. They're mm -hmm. usually in a difficult spot and recognizing that they have a need for empathy, um, advice, comfort, whatever is pretty easy. They're coming to me with a problem. And so it was easy for me to recognize that I needed to be empathetic. And so then to, and to put forth the effort to be empathetic. When I'm dealing with my children, it's a little more easy to recommend, recognize because they're dependent. Mm -hmm. And then when it came to you, there wasn't a dependence. And there wasn't to me an obvious Not need. an emotional dependence. Well, not really a dependence at all. Like you have never really been dependent on me. With the exception maybe of <laughs> financially. Ultra independence is a trauma response, y'all. Just saying. Well, right. Well, and, <laughs> and and I don't think that that's a bad thing. Right. But I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that the teachings of the church from the time I was itty bitty was don't get in the way of what the priesthood have to do in order to fulfill their priesthood duties. Right. Like it was don't, you know, Sarah, as a female, don't tempt a man before he goes on his mission, because if. Because if he has sex, it's your fault. And then he won't be able to go on a mission. And right. that means it's your fault, Sarah. Which also then automatically means that um, all of the people he would have baptized are now not going to get baptized. Because Sarah was a promiscuous slut. 
and this missionary couldn't control himself because he's a man and men cannot control themselves. I mean, that was definitely an implicit message. If you want to do that, that, that moral, like for men, it was don't masturbate, don't look at porn. And for women, it was don't show your body, don't act sexy, don't be too loud, don't jump too high, cover up your body, be small, be this, be that, don't, don't tempt him, don't. And it was like, dude, anytime the wind changes, a boy gets aroused. How the hell am I supposed to to breathe around a man? Like if I exhale, will you get aroused? That's kind of windy. <sighs> right. right. But my, my point being that from the time I was little, and then it was, you know, okay, you get married in the temple. And then it was support your spouse in their callings. And if you were the bishop's wife, like, or the bishop Rick's wife <laughs> or whatever, it was when the church calls you answer and I wait. I was always on the back burner to whatever you were doing, priesthood, duty wise. And then yeah. the church kept you so fucking busy that between your full time job, you're studying for anesthesia school, right? Your your study, so you your army job, and then you probably work when you were in leadership twenty to thirty hours a week for free for the church you didn't have any time or energy left over for us anyway. And the idea was the good Mormon wife is going to make sure that the kids are fed and cleaned and, you know, bathed and everything. So that way you could walk in, you could read them a bedtime story. You could pat them on their heads and you could send them off. And that's, I mean, that's apparent all the way back from like Joseph Smith and Brigham Young's time in a sense of they have, you know, all these polygamous wives and all of these children that they never spent time with, and yet they were still perceived to be these infallible, you know, near perfect men. Now, I know when I throw Brigham Young in there, everybody's like, oh, I don't know about Brigham Young. But when I looked at, you know, the bishops growing up, like when they were in the role of bishop, they took less family vacations. They, like, I remember in, in my life when my mom called and said, hey, we're having a crisis. Like our bishop lived around the corner from us. He was at our house in a couple of minutes. Like if his job allowed, he was there. It was like work came first when it had to come first, just because the bishop can't get fired. Right. But then after that, it was church. And so, yeah. So go ahead. (laughs) I could talk. Yeah. I'm starting to get like, I can see that. Yeah. So let me share a couple of things that I see as messages. First, I I have my scriptures open uh, to Doctrine and Covenants 121. And I found there's right next to these verses. There's something I wrote in and I could, I did, did just a quick Google search. Um, I'm not allowed to see first. No, he just no, hid you it have from to, me. You have to hear it like everybody else. Um, I tried to do a Google search of it and I couldn't find this quote. So I don't remember exactly who it's from except for what I wrote down. But this is what I wrote. It is the artful duty for the woman to adjust. What? Whoa, that's let me from, see this. It says from Sister McKay. So I don't know if that's from David O. McKay's wife or from another sister McKay that was a leadership, but let me talk about what it the does message say that, then yeah. is like, right. And this is from, I don't even know when these are my scriptures from seminary. These are from a long time ago. So did you ever get new ones after I did? I actually have a couple of different sets. One that I took on my mission that it's got lost artful duty um, for the woman to adjust. But let me just what talk about a fabulous thing yeah, that you up. grew up. Yes. Right. Well, so let's talk about the message that is there. When I, we're talking about my inability to be emotionally available, I think that the message that we get as men is that we don't have to be emotionally available. It mm-hmm. is your job to manage that stuff and mm-hmm. to just, and just, just let me tell the other example that will help here. Yeah, go ahead. If you've seen the movie Mary Poppins, the original one with Julie Andrews, I love it that begins movie. with. Um, the kids lose their kite, but the fr- one of the first songs is Mr. Banks comes into the house, sings a song about how his ho- house is totally in order. And one of the lines is, and then I pat them on their head and I send them off to bed. How lovely is the life I lead. And right. The idea being like everything in his house bows to the man. Mm-hmm. And he just gets to do the little happy little parts like, oh, it's so good to see you guys. I've been yeah. home for one minute. Now go to bed. Right. And, kiss, and it's, kiss, kiss. Love you. Right. Okay. And his his wife can't argue with him. It's No, because then deal. she's supposed to put out. 
Right. He, uh, and, and the underlying message there is she's fighting for votes for women. But the overlying message is that she she doesn't have any power in her home. And so I got taught implicitly. Like, okay. I don't think anybody ever came to me and said, it's not your responsibility to be there for your wife. I probably right. got that. I probably got an opposite message. You need to be there for your wife. Right. But um, what does be there for your wife right. mean? But then the overall message is simply that you take care of the home. I take care of my priesthood responsibilities. And by doing that, we're going to be emotionally tight. Well, And, I think and that, that was not our experience. I really think that, you know, kind of ties into the social norms of don't cry, be strong, don't be a pussy, stop crying like a girl, you know, and then the idea that the man's role is that you're supposed to work yourself into the grave. Like it is, you know, according to Mormonism, and then again, a lot of this old time societal thinking was that the man is supposed to provide enough money for the family to live comfortably. And basically the more money the man makes, the more value that he is supposed to have. And I'm not talking about financial value. I'm talking about like individual worth, self-esteem, confidence. Like if you're a doctor or a dentist or a lawyer and you're making, you know, six figures or more high six figures or more, then that is somehow tied into your intrinsic worth. And then the other thing is that you're supposed to be like maybe your kids coaches and whatnot, but then your job as a coach is be like, oh, you got to learn how to be strong. You got to learn how to win and this very competitive nature. And really what ends up happening is that men don't learn because they've never been expected to learn, nor has it ever been allowed for them to be sensitive and soft and kind. Like I remember growing up when, when my dad would like encourage Joey and I to wrestle, um, you know, I would hurt Joey and and Joey is a pseudonym for my younger brother, the one that's just younger than me. I would hurt Joey and he would start crying. And my dad would be like, toughen up. You're not going to let a girl make you cry. Are you? Um, There's a lot of societal shame. that goes Right. And so you're not allowed to feel. And if you're not allowed, like, it's like, feelings stopping it's like you know stuff it down stuff it down stuff it down don't bring it up you know when you're in the locker room and whatnot most men are not talking about their inner worlds or the challenges that they're having you know my experience and in talking to men i've never been in the male locker room maybe i haven't been in the male locker room (laughs) (laughs) i was a rebellious teen y'all but you know no my observation we are allowed to feel (laughs) But the only thing we're really allowed to feel from my experience and from my research is anger and contentment. That's that's really the only thing. And to be content. Yeah, because you can't ever be too content because you could always be making more money. You could always make your family a little more comfortable. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, all the jobs that you mentioned, doctor, lawyer, whatever, those all take to really be successful. They all take lots of time away from the home. Right. So I can provide for you very well financially but i right. can't provide for you in any other way and all of my needs like sex you mentioned that's just your job too which is what they pretty much talk about in the male locker room sex and how <laughs> we did on the field and working out but it's and your job to and provide who smells it. the worst and who's the biggest it's your job to you provide know, it measuring. it's not my job to earn it ah with the exception like of that. the messaging of finances right right like if I'm if I'm making below the poverty line as a man, how do I even face my wife? How do I even face my children? There's so much shame. Let me go back mm-hmm. to Brene Brown again when she does her her initial book, which is I thought it was just me, but it isn't. Later on, I th- I think what happened is later on she did another edition of it and she added in a final chapter that talks about men and their shame because she hadn't ever really researched that. Right. And that's the, they can't fall off their white horses. You just taken all my thunder. But, <laughs> but one of the things that she talks about <laughs> is that there seems to be this idea and women have stated it, that they would rather see their man die than fall off of his horse. Right. And there's Which... so much shame built into that, but it also doesn't allow me, if I can't even get off of my horse, how do I relate emotionally? Because from the horse, 
I am, I'm elevated. There's a power differential. If I'm talking to you on the ground from my horse, there's a natural power differential, whether I because want it or not. Because you're above me. I cannot, like, Physically, like a child, yeah. right? When you're, when you're, <laughs> wanna, when you're talking with a right. child, the best thing to do usually is to get down at their level, right? Kneel down and be at them face to face because you eliminate some of the power differential. Right. There's with, a reason. with this relationship, I can't do that for my high horse. So if if I'm not allowed to get off of it, I'm not allowed to fall off of it. Mm -hmm. How am I supposed to relate? Right. There's a reason children draw adults as like this great big head with like crazy long skinny <laughs> legs and like because arms so coming dead, out of our dumb, ears. Tall. <laughs> it's because that's their perception. Um, yeah. We don't start to get bodies until a kid is a little bit older. Right. Um. But no, I think that what, what you're talking about there in like, you know, a woman would rather see their husband die on the white horse. They don't think it's actually that women want their husbands to quote unquote die, but women aren't exposed to the normal range of men's emotions right. because from the time we're all little, you know, a woman's emotions are a sign of weakness um, or mental insanity. We, we have that. It, so, it depends. Some There's sort of some mental in, instability, yeah. right? Or weakness. But Uncontrolled if, emotions. Uncontrolled, whatever. Yeah. And then for the man, you're not allowed to feel these things, which inevitably means women aren't used to being available for when a man expresses their emotion. So when a man starts to get something other than angry or content, like when a man is scared, then the woman doesn't know what to do. Right. And we're talking about, you know, these heterosexual uh, right relationship it's going to be obviously different if you're right there's there's going to be differences in intimate relationships um that are not male female but i think too though is that the church really set us up for marital problems from the very beginning because it was hurry hurry you know get home from your missions so you're not allowed to date alone until the girl has graduated from high school and the guy is home from his mission right and then it's once you start dating, you need to get married. Like as soon as it's a potential marital material, it is get married and have kids right away. And what that does is it does not allow the partners in the relationship to truly experience each other during different phases of normal life like generally sure. you're not going to see each other sick you're not going to see each other moody like you know i see so many people they're like until you're pregnant <laughs> can you imagine what it would have been like if i'd been able to get pregnant like that first couple of months it's, yeah what a lot of people go through yeah well but how that would have changed the trajectory so you guys i was not a good pregnant woman i was emotional i was all over the place i was puking i was unreasonable it was bad. So just imagine if I had been able to get pregnant in those first three months, how that would have impacted us for the next 25 years, because you and I had what, two and a half, almost three years together before Eric joined our family. And in those two and a half, three years, we saw each other at our best. We saw each other struggle. We did some hardships together while I was in my reasonable cognitive mm -hmm. brain, not the crazy right. hormone pregnancy brain. And that, you know, once Eric came, our dynamic shifted because now we have to take care of this right. little, he was so cute, this little, you know, blob of a baby who's crying. And he was a bunny. Eric was super easy. Now, if we'd had Brig first, we'd have died. Yeah. But my, my point being that then our focus is all on baby and it's natural for a woman after they have a baby or even for me after I adopted a baby. The majority of, of our focus, focus yeah. is on the baby. And so mm -hmm. then you also have these societies where like with the Mormon church, the woman is supposed to stay home and take care of pretty much everything at home. And the man is supposed to go to work. But I didn't hear a lot like growing up of nurturing your relationship or doing these things. So you get married young, you get married fast before you really know somebody, you have a baby right away before you really get to know each other. And then you're meant to do this and endure to the end while serving in all of these various callings. We weren't trained in our religious organization how to communicate with each other, not really how to communicate with anybody outside of those who agreed with right. everything that we said. Right. And so really what I'm looking at here for our, for our men is that 
if they show their emotions, they get in trouble. If they don't show their emotions, they get in trouble. If they get tired or burned out with their job or they need to do a career change, which is going to cause the family to struggle financially, the woman isn't supposed to be able to go to work and pitch in and help right. cover that cost. Like none of that was, I mean, we joined the military because our, which I'm grateful for. I, I, I have no regrets about joining the military at, at all. I, I mean, it was a great decision for us. It's been, it was a great experience, but we looked at the military because we had Eric and there was no way we were going to make the unrighteous decision for Eric to be babysat by somebody other than me so that I could go work full time to put you through nursing school. That, that it wasn't even an option. It didn't even come up. Yeah, it I'm didn't even come back to our conversations. We never even talked about that possibility. No, it was. I mean, the expectation was Mason yeah. had to figure this out on his own because it was his job to provide. Now, a lot of families do do that. But right. even then, as soon as the man's gone through college and can get his job, you're you're done. You're I'm done. back in the home. Right. So it's OK for those few years to get the man his career. Mm -hmm. But after that, you're not supposed to be out there working. Well, and so. Yeah. I can speak to, you know, for me, even once all of my kids were like, so I started, I opened my private practice when Abby started all day pre-K. And then I worked mm -hmm. my hours while my kids were at school. So that way I was still home when they were home. And then in the summer, I got a babysitter, but I only worked three days a week. Like it was, it was very controlled so that I was still there for the kids. Right. right? Which, is, which is good for the kids. It was right? good for we're, the kids. We're not complaining about the kids having a parent at home. Right. It, it was good for our kids. However, if I had been asked to leave Eric when he was little, after being raised in an environment where I was supposed to be a stay at home mom, what resentment would there have been? And how would I have held that against you? Especially right. since you couldn't even see when we got married. And I know this sounds really mean and I'm not trying, I'm not intending it for it to be mean. But when we got married, you were what, 22? Mm -hmm. And then how old were you when you joined? Like 25, 26 when you joined the military? Joined the Army. Because you couldn't figure out what you wanted to do with your life that would actually earn a livable income for us. Like we got roped into these commitments because of pressures from an external, from an external source. Yeah. And I mean, we, we've talked about how that you know, harmed me, but I think it also harmed you because the expectation for you was literally like work yourself to death before Sarah goes to work and oh, sure. is away from the children. Lots of men feel like they have to have two or three jobs. My so, dad did. So that they can, so the mom can still be home. Yeah, my dad was a teacher. And, and granted, so was yours. Yeah, and granted, and there's, other, there's other things that go into that. Of course, yeah. the cost of daycare can be really tough. And so there's go, those kind of things. But it wouldn't be as much of an issue if we were both taught to go to school, mm -hmm. if we were both taught to have a career. Right. You know, like we've talked about your parents and my parents. If my mom wanted to leave my dad right now. She's, she they're both fucked. No, well, she does have some education. Let me take that back. She She could be a massage therapist. But she's also getting older. She's not. Mm -hmm. She she's not going to earn a livable no, wage doing I'm, massage therapy I'm at sixty five years old. I'm going to say that if your mom or my mom wanted to leave their husbands at this phase of their life, they would have no financial resources unless one right. of their kids. They'd have to go to live with the child, yep. or they'd have they would to have get to be support. dependent because the church is the man earns the money and the woman is like one of the things that I see Mason is that when you take our kids to the doctor, you're constantly texting me. What about this? What about that? Because you don't know. And it's not because, I mean, you're a freaking doctor, right? You have a doctorate degree in nursing practice and you and can't I try answer. To stay active in my kids' lives. Too, and you can't answer half the questions the does most of it, because yeah. you're at work and I'm the one that still yeah. manages it. And it's because once again, the church is like, have a whole bunch of kids. Like right. you're supposed to have as many children as you can possibly handle, which when they're little, nobody talks to you about the expenses of auto insurance when they're teenagers and taxi cab. Like it's, it's put a huge financial <laughs> strain because we have seven kids and I wouldn't trade a single, well, me, no, I'm just teasing. I wouldn't trade any of my kids. 
I love all of my children, but we were making decisions because of outside pressures without thinking it all the way through to what would happen right. in certain times. Like if you were incapacitated today, yes, I do have a, a job skill that I could do, but we would have to move. There's no way I would be able to afford our mortgage. Hey, head on over to Amazon and buy your copy of Trauma Bonded, a true story of navigating attachments forged in complex PTSD by me, Sarah Westbrook. And so that puts a lot of pressure on you in you can't get hurt. You can't like you cannot fail because if you fail, the whole family will fail. You and that's just not a healthy, apart, yeah. right. It's not a healthy place to be. Men end up getting burned out because they are relied on too much to fulfill all of these roles. And women expect them to, because that's how it's always yeah. been. And, and, and so we've, we've really got to, we've really got to switch that. Well, and I don't, I think it's important to say that there's nothing necessarily wrong with this setup of you know, one spouse goes to work, the other spouse stays at home, whether that's the man or the woman right. to take care of the kids. I don't think there's anything wrong with that setup. The concern is the reasons why we pursue right. that setup. What is the, the messages intent? that we're getting, mm -hmm. the shame that comes along with it. Um, if right now I was to, if we were to decide, you know what, you're going to work full time, I'm going to stay home and take care of the kids. You know, the messaging that would come from that, the shame that might come from that is I think we would not die. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I imagine we could probably handle it, but it would be rough. But it would be certainly a big transition. And and that's not mm -hmm. even what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the outside messages that you might get because of just right. the change. And I think that that is changing. I know some guys who stay at home with their kids while their wives work. And I think that that's great. But it's the choice that they make. Whereas we right, growing with, up felt like we didn't have that choice. Within, the choice was made for you know, us. John Delin uses the term like with informed consent. Right. Like I think that nowadays young adults are able to be more intentioned, more mindful of the choices that they're making because they are thinking, you know, the five-year plan, the 10-year plan, the 20-year plan with regards to family planning and financial planning and when to start bringing children into the home. Like it's more commonplace now for people to wait to have kids until, you know, careers have been at least somewhat established and, and whatnot, right. which I think is good, but I still think where we've got a huge deficit for our men is, you know, sexual health for one and emotional health for two. And I think that those two things are so intrinsically entwined that it's oftentimes hard to, right. to separate them. And so right. is there something else that you had, Mason, before we move into the sexual health stuff that um, we um, had planned? Like, is this your whole list? You've got... That's my, no, I've got notes, a whole bunch of other places. All right, look so. at Sarah's notes <clears throat> to Mason's notes, y'all. This is pretty normal. Wait, wait. There's a whole page of notes here. Stop, stop shaming me for what I didn't write oh, down. Oh, I wasn't shaming you, honey. I was talking. I, I what I okay. <laughs> let me clarify. Look how organized his is versus how crazy mine is. That's what I was meaning. To say. Um, I I don't I don't think so. Okay. I think that just there's a balance to all of this and mostly it comes down to what have we decided to do like if mm -hmm. I, I know women who all they really want to be is a mother right but and, and that's great yeah but is that because they've been taught their whole life that that's what they're supposed to be or is it because that really is all they want to be and either way is okay right but we have to recognize wh why do I want these things why do I want to make a million dollars a year <laughs> is it because right. I've been taught that unless I provide as much as possible to my family, I don't have worth? Mm -hmm. Or is it because I simply want to be financial, financially secure? Whatever, what's the cost right. if I do that? Mm -hmm. If I if I'm going to make a million dollars a year, does that mean I'm never going to be at home? And is that the sacrifice that I want to make? Right. I want to recognize what choices are being asked of me and be able to step back and go, 
what is it that I actually want and be able to talk with you. What is it that we want? Right. What works as best for Look, us I'm, as a team. I can make a million dollars a year, but I'm not going to be home. Right. Or well, I, I could be home all you want, but I'm only going to make 20,000 a year. Right? right. We have to be able to talk about it and come to an agreement as to what we want as a couple, as partners. Right. Well, and one of the things that, that comes to mind for me is that, you know, when I entered the workforce and then when you retired from the military, there were still, and, and this is not, so um, let's see, I entered the workforce around Abby was born. I'm thinking 16, around 2016 was when I opened my private price was the end of 2016 when Abby started pre K three full day pre K um, because she qualified because of her special her special needs. Right. You didn't and so, open your office until. And that's when I opened my office and I started to work full time outside of the home. And you did not start with really an equal share of the in home labor, like the division of labor in the home until maybe two years ago. And it, mm-hmm. and one of the reasons for that, well, number one, we did just it it just we never even thought about it to talk about it it was right. like the pattern was set. I, right the pattern was set that mason pretty much came home ate dinner played with the kids now you've always put the kids to bed and you've always done the dishes right i've always been involved but you're talking right. about recognizing hey you're working full time so am i right now that so i'm now, now that how i'm do gone we divide these chores right out. now that i'm yeah. gone from the house 40 hours a week because of my job plus however many hours a week i'm gone because of medical appointments and right. stuff for the kids and sporting events and blah 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 but i'm still the one that was primarily expected to keep the house clean keep up on the laundry make sure the kids were getting the bathed, grocery shopping, grocery the shopping meal, planning. meal planning cooking all of it i still did it until about two years ago when i was like hey hey I need you to listen. And one of the incidentally common... about the time that you had your mental breakdown. So that was three we... years ago. It was about but a year about after about yeah. that time. Mm-hmm. So you got pushed to the brink before right. I was even aware <laughs> that I needed to step in. And, and again, that comes right. down to some of that message. Well, and I hear so many women when I do my couples counseling that are like, he never helps. He doesn't cook. He doesn't clean. He doesn't this. And he's just a toxic man. And I think for most of those men, it's that they don't have an awareness yeah. that it even is like, I don't think men in that situation, you know, because I don't think obviously not all men unavailable or unhelpful. I don't think that's what we want. Right. I just don't think it was ever modeled for mm-hmm. them. So again, it's, it's that exposure. So again, I don't, yeah. for, for the most part, I don't think men are toxic. I think if I was to describe or define toxic masculinity it would be a man who is intentional in lording over harming manipulating their partners or other human beings and i think that most men just because of societal norms or religious norms they're they're wounded and then when they try to seek healing they get kicked for it. So let me give one example. I think this will lead into the sexual health that you want to talk about. It's an example that from the scriptures. Do you know what the first example in the scriptures of polygamy is? Mm, well, which scriptures? The Bible. Uh, Abraham? Yeah, Abraham. So let me explain. I in got detail. it right. Ah! Let me explain in, in <laughs> detail why this matters. Right. Abraham is a hundred years old, 90 years old. He's old, dude. He's old. Sarah is somewhere around 80 or 90 years old. They were 10 years apart. Didn't she have a baby after that too? At 90. Um, So (laughs) Abraham gets all these promises that he's going to be. Pause. If you want to know how truthful the scriptures are, I don't think there's very many 90 year olds getting pregnant in real life. I think think that's a completely irrelevant statement. But anyway, I don't. um, (laughs) Anyway, she's unable to give him a child. He's got all these promises that his seed will bless the world, basically. And he can't, she can't give her a child. So what does she do? She gives him her servant. She essentially initiates polygamy because she feels shame 
over the fact that she cannot fulfill her responsibility as a woman. Which God did not command. No. I mean, there or we get taught in the church that God commanded that, but there's it's no not in the scriptures. There's nothing in the scriptures that says that. And I don't that. think it's in the Joseph Smith translation either. So what is in there is that God tells Abraham to go ahead and listen to his wife. God never told Sarah to make that decision. So polygamy essentially gets initiated. Apparently, because it's the woman's fault. The woman is feeling <laughs> shame because she cannot provide a child. Yeah, I know what Abraham. that's like. And. The provide not being able to provide a child part, not that you can sleep with somebody else so that you can have a kid. Right. I'm just gonna adopt somebody's but, parent instead. So we go to extremes sometimes in order to fulfill what we consider our responsibilities. Mm-hmm. And so if we don't have the ability to Ooh, step back example. from those responsibilities and examine them, mm-hmm. then we might make choices that don't really fall in line with what we want for ourselves or what we think is healthy. Like Sarah. So Sarah gets glamorized a little bit because she made this choice. She made this sacrifice, but what happened, but what happened later on? Oh, Sarah Sarah was so upset because Ishmael was threatening Isaac because of this sibling rivalry that she kicked her out of the house. And so it was not a healthy dynamic obviously not you know it wasn't this well i mean happy this go is lucky. after you're Abraham my best friend now because we're still his own wives. damn kid um no no it was before that okay well so and then abraham tries to kill his anyway, damn the, kid. the point being that we when we don't feel like we're filling our prescribed roles right we will make decisions that don't necessarily fall in line with what we want for ourselves i really like goodness so, henry you startled me i really I really like that example. Man, that's two. That's two today. Good I'm out of here. <laughs> Doors over there. You keep going, I'm out of here. Yeah, but I'd have to like go around or something. <laughs> like I'm stuck. I'm trapped right now. <laughs> no. All right. So let's talk. Why don't you lead into what you wanted to talk about for a second? So I really wanted to talk about <laughs> the, you know, when we talk about men being sexually toxic, um, I want to talk about the religious messaging. And this is so prominent outside of Mormonism too. Like I've been, you know, chatting recently with some um, really evangelical like Baptists and um, evangelism and and whatnot. And so things like masturbation is considered a sin Um, and any porn use is suddenly termed addiction. Um, And we've talked on here many times about age appropriate masturbation that we utilize masturbation in sex therapy um, for rehabilitation um, to build sexual connection like that, that that's a whole other topic that we're not going to break down Mm -hmm. today other than to say, Hey, from a scientific and a medical standpoint, masturbation is a tool that it has its uses. That has its uses and it, it, that is meant to be pleasurable. It's a tool that has its uses. It's meant to be pleasurable and it's age appropriate and normal for both men and women to masturbate from very young ages. Um, And so one of the things that I think our men get is, is that there's this like this standard of you cannot participate in something that is biologically beneficial to you because when you do that it means you don't love your woman as much it means you don't it means you're dirty it means you're a pervert it means you can't fill in the blank and that's a really toxic message like from from a medical science and and from a mental health perspective and whatnot because then it throws me into shame so talking about right. me specifically, it throws me into shame. Do you want to share your experience with that? <clears throat> if if you're ready for that. Sure, but, go ahead. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt your your thought process, Dude, but that's what happens. Is I it, appreciate the apology, but uh, this is how we do. Go for it. It's how you do. This is how I do. I don't do, do the interrupting thing very often, although I'm getting better at it. <laughs> getting better at interrupting? <laughs> Yeah. That's good. So you can so, get a word in edgewise. Incidentally, yeah, go ahead. sort of a squirrel. Squirrel! The reason, the, the underlying reason that masturbation has always been an issue from a religious standpoint is because Jacob's son, Judah, spilled his seed on the ground and was reprimanded for that by God. 
Um, so if he had spilled it in a sock, that would have been okay? No. No. <laughs> the implied message there is that because his seed did not go where it's supposed to go, which is a vagina, um, he was reprimanded for that. And uh, God, I was I, I think really that's concerned the, about the nitty gritty details. I think that's the underlying where that comes from. Yeah. I don't know. You know, I almost feel like in the Bible, it's like God was so interested in the in, you know, the nitty gritty, itty bitty, every minute detail of everything that he got himself so dang burned out that he just don't talk to us no more. So he's like to start, it's like his oldest children burned him out. So we're the youngest. And he's like, I don't care what you guys do. Just don't bug me to start. I'm watching my shows. Please understand that how you feel about as a listener about masturbation or pornography that's that's on you. And I don't and I don't think that there's necessarily anything wrong with one way or the other, as long as you're communicating with yourself, with your spouse, mm -hmm. with anyone that might be involved in that. Yeah. So let me give a, a caveat. So when it comes to marital therapy, when I'm working with couples, when we talk about pornography use or masturbation use for either couple, the rule is disclosure and boundaries. If in the relationship you've agreed that that's okay and whatever those rules are surrounding surrounding it or between the husband and the wife or, you know, the, the partners, so male, male, female, female, whatever, um, open relationships as well. So as right. long as all of the adults that are participating in the intimate relationship are boundaried and they've talked about what is what they're comfortable with, what they're uncomfortable with, then it's then it's going to be okay. Because really where the danger lies in pornography is, hey, Mason needs to go feed the chickens. They're all dead. You need to like... It said my meds and chickens. You need Let's, to like change it. Y'all, we don't have chickens anymore. No, no squirrels. Keep Squirrel! Them, them okay, so anyway, um, the, the idea is that it's the secretiveness that is so damaging. It's the feeling of betrayal when with discovery that becomes very damaging about this. Now, having said that, porn use, according to the Gottmans, pornography use can damage relationships right. when it's utilized more often than occasionally. I would have to actually go back and look at that note to see what the, what the guidelines are there. But I know that during like sexual rehabilitation and, and certain things, we do utilize ethical pornography and ethical pornography, meaning um, pornography sites that... Um, where women actually get paid. Where women get paid, uh, right. They get paid the in, better than an industry standard. Um, they, these are companies that are, you know, monitored by outside agencies to make sure that yeah. they are not participating in human trafficking or violence against women right. or men against any of their actors and that the actors are paid the appropriate wage. So ethical pornography. Um, one of the ones that I've recommended in the past is Lust Cinema. Uh, to clients because they do have those types of things. Um, but as long as there is open communication about it and disclosure within the relationship, then it minimizes issues that, that come from that. All right, go ahead, Mason. Oh, he's writing it out. Hang on, I'm going to read over his shoulder. Just a note for what I need to put in the show notes. So. Oh. Um, yeah, you're going to put a link to pornography. No, in but show. that's what, <laughs> what made me think about it. So, so, Cool. Um, if you haven't been listening to any of our podcasts or have not read Sarah's book, let me just give you a little bit of background. So in the book, she describes that in 2004, she had an affair with a previous, her previous boyfriend from high, high school. school. Sweetheart, yep. It's called trauma bonded. There's a lot that goes into that um, pain and hurt on both sides. Well, yeah. let me share just a little bit of what happened to me. Just a few weeks after that, I deployed. Yeah, um, it was sucky. I did not have. And he did not know he was deploying before the marital affair, which is huge. Yeah. In my opinion. Um, we got notice afterwards. So I did not have the emotional ability to actually work through that with you. Right. Which is also sort of described in the book. Um, but we've certainly talked about it since right. then. I don't remember how much of that's described in the book. So we didn't really work through it. Mm -hmm. I just thought it had stopped. You read the book, you'll see that there, my understanding of the situation wasn't exactly accurate either. Um, it stopped before you deployed. But it stopped before I deployed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. I'm hurt. You're hurt. Mm -hmm. We're emotionally feeling wounds. We, I still didn't even know that I wasn't emotionally available to you. I thought it was right. just something else that was going on. 
um, I didn't really understand how emotionally you were struggling with with our connectivity until years later. Right. Um, so I spend six, seven months deployed. I'm angry. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. hurt. And I didn't really struggle with pornography then at all. Actually, I there right. were some Maxim magazines of what I considered from my Mormon upbringing, what I considered <laughs> basically pornography. Right. Which, like, which it's, it's not Cosmo. Maybe, right. It may be it's <laughs> soft porn. Certainly for me, it felt that way. Right. Okay. It was also well, well, the first I think, time. I think that's important because the intent, the exposure, the way that you were perceiving what that material was influences your choices surrounding it. Like if so, you looked at Maxim and said, this is soft pornography, then from your perspective, that is what it was. And therefore you're looking at it was right outside of your moral standards right um it's also the first time in my life that i ever masturbated um i was gone for seven months you know most people will be like well yeah duh right but right. that was not but me. that was significant because you had never participated you'd never experienced masturbation that you remember in high school or elementary school like it that it was just never something that you did right. which is abnormal so Right. So funny little trope. I was so uncomfortable with the idea that I didn't touch myself at all. Like it was all like rubbing myself on the cot or whatever. So it's just kind of, it's kind of funny, right? But because it speaks to where I was, like I was uncomfortable even touching myself. Um, Because that's just the message that we got growing up in the church and the message that I think a lot of people still get, even though masturbation is pretty common. Um, yeah, so I, I'm looking at where the, I the was top though. Leadership of the church, I'm pretty certain most of them, if not all of them, are being dishonest about their own <laughs> private activities. That's, a, that's mm-hmm. a conversation for a totally new other day. But Just so, where I was, I was hurting, I was emotionally struggling. Mm-hmm. We there wasn't very much ability for us to communicate. We Correct. even tried, like, we tried to do I am messaging and stuff to to release sexual tension for both of us. And that didn't really work out very well just because of technology the way it was in 2004. Yeah, that was a long time um, It's ago. a lot different now, right? It's like um, 20 years ago. Hey, head on over to Amazon and buy your copy of Trauma Bonded, a true story of navigating attachments forged in complex PTSD by me, Sarah Westbrook. Diagnose Zeithochdruck. Wir verschreiben... Ausreichend Zeit für PatientInnen. Herzlich willkommen im Krankenhaus St. Josef Braunau. Jetzt bewerben als Ärztin oder Arzt für Innere Medizin. khbr.at slash karriere So I had my first experience with just a little bit of what I would consider porn then. And then when I came home, still a little bit angry, still more exposure. Mm-hmm. And so I then ended up struggling a little bit with pornography. And with actual pornography. With actual pornography. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it was because of the resentment that I felt towards you. So I want to pause for a minute. You say I was struggling with pornography, but how often had you looked at it? Like, give me like hours, minutes, days, how often? Like, what was your frequency when we talk about struggle? Because you felt like there was a an, an underlying addiction, correct? Yeah. So you felt like there was an underlying addiction. What was your usage like? Do you remember? Um, in 2006, I don't think I looked at porn at all. It was like the ads in the middle of the night for um, Girls Gone Wild <laughs> that came on. <laughs> um, and then it was, I didn't really actually look at porn, I think, until 2009 when we were separated for um officer basic i think that was the first time that i looked at it and there was some some resentment some build up there that that just was just kind of like you know what i don't care she did this right so i'm gonna i'm gonna do this so kind of thing. you felt like there was an addictive issue and we are talking about a handful of times yeah that you looked mm-hmm. for how many minutes each experience couple three four ten twenty thirty maybe as much as like 10 to 30 minutes because I didn't just like delve right into what, right. what, but to be honest, what I would do now, I didn't just delve right into the things that would 
just allow me to do, do what thing. I needed to do. Yeah. So right. because there was still lots of shame involved. Right. So you're you talking kind of, about you kind of feel around. And so it would have been a longer process. Sounds fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, so so let's just say it was six times because that makes math easy for Sarah. You're talking about three hours a year. Max. Max. Yeah. And you felt like there that's, was an, that's an addiction. addiction. Yeah, that's an addiction. And right in there. 2009. That was 2009. Right. But so in 2009 was the max. So we're talking about three hours. Mm -hmm. You went to the bishop in San Antonio. Not 2009. Okay. When was that? That was in 2013. So 2013. So how bad was it then between 09 and 13? At, at its absolute worst. Um. So I never looked at porn when I was in the bishopric. Ever which was from 2010 to 2013. So that's okay. three years. I never, never looked at it then. Right. And in 2013, I don't really remember. It wasn't very much. It wasn't like, significantly if, different. If I remember before. correctly, it was like a couple of minutes, like maybe three or four times. I, that sounds so we're gonna give him, right. We're going to give him in 2013, the year that he was off of being the bishopric, we're going to give him two hours. Okay. <laughs> and you did what? You went to the bishop. And handed him my recommendation. And handed him your recommendation. And he was mad at you. Do you remember that? He said mm -hmm. he was mad at you. Mm -hmm. He was appropriate. But yeah, he was angry. He was angry. Yeah. So we're talking about total over the course of your lifetime, maybe 10 hours in your whole life. Up until the last couple of years, for sure. Yep. Last for couple sure. of years. Yeah. <laughs> last couple of well, years when his wife changes. is like... Okay, it's not right. There's been toxic. some changes that maybe we'll talk about. We're talking yes, about before 10 that. hours in 20, 30, 40, 40 years of your life, 10 hours and 40 years of your life, and that's an addiction. Well, sure, but we're actually talking about like a 10 year period, so yeah, 10 year period, but still, that's an hour a year. 10 hours total in a 10 year period, an hour Don't a year. Minimize my shame makes no, I'm I'm. I'm helping to be like, okay, look at how ridiculous this sounds. When you really break it down, you addict you. Like the church had you go to their addictions recovery course. And the majority of the times that you utilize pornography, we were physically separated because of military training. Correct? Yeah. Almost always, if not or always. Or just my, my schedule as it was. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. Or, or our schedules were completely opposite. So mm -hmm. it was what it was. Yeah. And, you know, you know, for, speaking from a biological standpoint for prostate health, regular ejaculation is important. But don't spill your seed on the ground. But not on the ground. Use a sock. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Keep going. Talk about this. <laughs> Talk about this. Oh, um, my gosh. So anyway, after 2013, I got my recommend back a couple months later, and I really hadn't struggled with that again until right. I got until um, when we were deployed. But that was almost entirely you and me together. Technology had changed, and so we we had you know phone sex. Oh, so you didn't use it again? Yeah. yeah. So we yeah, had we you know we were able to use video Zoom chats and what's that, like baby? That. Yeah. So. Oh, that was it's different. Encrypted. <laughs> that was different. Um, and then this definitely is an R rated. The show. year that we were separated, <laughs> but when you moved to Missouri and I had to stay in Texas, then there was some of that. But we were separated for a year, eleven, almost months. a year. Eleven, and months. of course we did some visits there, but we were separated. And right. um, and then I really didn't, and that was almost always with you as well, almost always. Mm -hmm. Um. And then when we got here and I had to do weekend call down at Fort Leonard Wood, which was an hour and a half away. And I had to stay there that whole 72 hours with honestly not very but, much to do. But at that point, we were talking about the use. Ooh, I just for the, for the most part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but, but I mean, like at that point, I was out of the church and I was like, no, look. I no, I'm talking before that. Okay. But I think at that point, we had still had the conversations of, hey, this is what the research says. You have the green light for me at that point of, hey, this is healthy. This is normal. 
Yeah, somewhere. It was no longer timing. secretive. Yeah, it's hard for me. But you're. It's hard for me, honestly, to to kind of categorize all of that because there's so much shame built around the use. Right, and that's really what I was going to like that... pull you back into. Like, what was the messaging, as you are saying, that is contributing to this toxic, like this this inaccurate label of men are quote unquote toxic. Well, let me go back to one other thing that I did that was really harmful to the two of us. Okay. And it also comes a little bit from this messaging. Um, <clears throat> when we got married, you were 98 pounds. Thin as a rail. Ooh, gorgeous. Curvy. Gorgeous. Yeah. Curvy. Yeah. Yes. 98 yum, yum. pounds. C cup. I was, I was model figured. My, my body was very toned and fit. I was a dancer. Yes. Um, so yes, all the I, things, all I, the I, things. yes, I, I look good, y'all. So I look good. And then, <laughs> not too long after that, you started taking Clomid. Yep. You Started taking other infertility, infertility drugs. I had um, a couple of surgeries. Had a couple of surgeries. Mm -hmm. So at some point in time, I don't remember when you gained some weight because Clomid will just do that to you, mm -hmm. and you had gained a significant amount <laughs> by the time that I left for deployment in 2004. You were, you were 130 pounds, right? So I was actually, so 120 pounds was healthy. 130 pounds. Um, what would have been a little more than you wanted? Yeah. I was a little more than I wanted, but 120 pounds is where the doctor wanted me. Like the doctor right. wanted me between 120 and 125 pounds. So I was 130 pounds, but I was no longer uh-oh, uh Calvin sat out there. In 2006, you had a baby. Then I had a baby. 2008, you had a baby. Babies are not kind to a woman's body. Somewhere in there, I don't even remember when, I made a comment to the effect of, and I don't remember what I said. Maybe you do, but I don't remember what I said. Oh, but bad. to the effect of, you weren't I wasn't attractive to anymore. Me anymore because yeah. of the way that your body had changed. Um yeah. Hate, was, hate me if you want. That is what you said. <laughs> that was a very. You said, I don't find you very sexy anymore because of the weight that you have gained and the way that your body has changed. And I was just like. So I have Oof. struggled to overcome that and the way that that affects our relationship mm -hmm. ever since then. Yeah. Because I did not. Oh, it was a huge trauma response I didn't mean for me. to hurt you. Mm -hmm. And I did. I didn't really think through everything that that implied. Well, but again, nobody prepared you for a woman's body is going to change. Like mm -hmm. your mom has always been skinny as a rail. Yeah. Um, and then obviously you never saw my mom pregnant and my mom was always very fit. And then. Well, and then every message that you get on TV, mm -hmm. books, Every message that you get right. is that a woman really only has significant value with if their she pretty. looks good. Right. And and it's actually really interesting. We were talking to the movie producer, director, screenwriter, because mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to get trauma bonded adapted for the screen right now. And one of the things he said, you know, we're getting ready to do a book trailer. And he said, and I was like, hey, are, you know, with actors and whatnot, are we going to be worried about making sure that, you know, that they kind of represent us in looks. And, and what I was referring to was like, you know, brunette with hazel eyes, brunette with blue eyes, blonde right. with blue eyes. And he was like, no, not really. All we're really doing is making sure that they're attractive because what we know is that if the actors are attractive, more people will click on it and engage with the ad. Right. And I was just like, well, that's so every message, stupid, the but Nagoski, it's true. The Nagoski sisters call it the bikini industrial complex. It yeah. is a billions and billions of dollars right. every year trying to make women feel shamed because they don't look perfect. Well, and trying to tell men this is what your woman right. needs to look like. And so, again, our men are not toxic. The it's it's that what are they being exposed to because unless you're being exposed to an environment where women are of all shapes and sizes are beautiful and desirable well it's it's going to be difficult for a man to sort through all those and i'm not saying that men are stupid i'm saying this is biology we don't well, learn to adapt to things until we are exposed to them i think the difference for me was the lack of emotional connection Oh, yeah, for sure. 
and you know, I don't know what it is for everybody else, but for me, it was a lack of emotional connection because I love you. I want to be with you. I've never had any desire to be with anybody else. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the fact that your body is changing because of normal stuff, like you can't control you. You, you can't control up, what your body it. does. And well, then you had a C-section the first time and it was emergency C-section. Yeah, I got you a nasty scar. You can't control what that does to your body. And frankly, some people cannot, like cannot overcome what that does to their body. Yeah, some people right. can. So for the record, you you said it after I'd had Hayden, but before I'd had Katie. Okay. So it was after the um, C-section. So in between six and six And your and concern eight. was that I had that flap of muscle that hung mm. over. So I know I was no longer flat and toned yeah because the c-section I'm loving, I'm loving how good this makes me sound <clears throat> not we all, all have shit not at all but anyway so the the shame is there because because i i said that well now if i if i look at pornography you know most of us when we look at pornography oh i'm getting a message hold on a second Does it 10 more minutes? Well, if we're trying to keep our show under 90 minutes, we're at 123.16. So, all right. So, we're going to go over when today, you're looking I at think. pornography, you're always looking at essentially perfect bodies. Mm-hmm. So, if I look at pornography, there's this underlying guilt of and shame of all the messages I've received, but there's always for me that underlying shame too that this is going to hurt my wife because once again, I'm looking at the perfect body instead of yours. Mm -hmm. And that is, that was really hard for me to overcome. And I still struggle with it some, but that was really hard for me to overcome until the messaging between us became different, Mm -hmm. which has only been over the last couple of years, really. That was always a struggle. And so there was, there was more shame involved because the message that I'm telling myself is, well, I'm struggling with pornography because they just look better than my wife. Mm-hmm. It wasn't true, but that right. was the messaging that I was getting. Well, and and, it and makes... I was afraid it was the message that you were getting too. Well, see, and you got blessed in the sense that I have a master's degree in this. And so I actually know from the studies that yes. when a man is looking at pornography, it's not because their wife is undesirable. That's like, I already knew that. So I got that buffer, whereas, right. At whereas least most not in general. women don't. Maybe sometimes that's the case. Right. Most but... women don't get that, which is one of the things that we cover all all the time when right. pornography is an issue within within the relationship is the, you know, what are the myths and, and what are the facts? Right. But one of the things that, you know, I think that this also comes a little bit from from the religion that you're in. And, and the, re- the only reason that I say this is because plastic surgery is more pop in the United States, more popular in, in Utah than any other state, including California, um, where you have Drive the Hollywood right? actors and actresses. And so I don't know where that came from other than the church's consistent blame that it is the woman's fault or responsibility to manage a male's arousal and it is the man's res- responsibility not to look at pornography and not to masturbate. But if there's any problems in that area, the Mormon church has a history of blaming the woman for it consistently. Society in general. Though. Society in general. But Mormonism reinforces that. And again, Mormonism and a lot of these other high demand organizations are way behind the times yeah. in the sense of they're not looking at the research. They're not trying to understand what's going on at its core. Yeah. And so, and they're not willing to look at that data because it doesn't fit their narrative. That's my opinion. Yeah. Um, and so I think that it's really important, you know, as, as we're getting ready to close, do you have anything else that you wanted to say on that, by the way? Um, maybe just a little adage that there's, there's pornography use now in my life but it's it's open between us and understood that that's going on right we have developed boundaries around that and there's open dialogue so that there's not secretive sneaking you know there's no sneaking behind my back there's you know it's it's open we talk about it and it's within the limits of what we've discussed is comfortable for both of us right and 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 it has i think improved our relationship well, I find that I'm a less intense man 
when I'm not struggling with that. And so some of it is simply because right. I want to be able to be emotionally involved. And so sometimes when that's the avenue that I take, it's simply because I, I just don't want to be intense about that. Right, well, I don't want to be That's a biological, and... physiological need. Like we're talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah. If you're feeling sexually frustrated, it's really hard to deal with the other stressors in your life. And usually in our relationship, if you're feeling sexually frustrated, it's not because of a lack of desire on either of our parts. It's usually a lack of time where we are yeah. physically together without children. Yeah. Again, we have a ton of children. And so it's a logistical issue for us. Yeah. Um, if it's Mostly. not right. If, if and frankly, when you're sexually frustrated, that's not the time that I'm gentle and kind. Like I would need to be in no. order to have that kind of relationship with us. Like, right. Because you need your needs met too. And so, so a lot of it is just for that reason. Yeah, absolutely. And so I would definitely say if, if you're having issues with sexual intimacy in your relationship, find a qualified therapist that has specialty yeah. training in, in sex therapy. Um, because it's, it, it's very beneficial. Um, overall. Yeah. Um, and, and if they're using evidence-based research methods to help treat that, then usually the outcome is improved sexual intimacy. Part of the reason um, probably why a lot of your couples stagnated when they're from the church, because that's not an option for them. Right. Right. Well, it, when, now you're teaching when we were talking outside the line, right. When we were talking about sexual intimacy, absolutely. But I was seeing the stagnation across all areas, right. specifically anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. It was just like, I, I don't understand. Okay. So squirrel again. Um, so I would say that in closing, um, I see a lot of, Hey, there's my other dog that's locked outside. Um, I see, whoops, he's just outside the door. Um, I see a lot of behaviors in clinic where women are coming in and saying, my husband is toxic or my partner is toxic or all men are toxic. And I want to clear the air and say that until a man is exposed, it, until any human, this is not exclusive to men, but until a human is exposed and made aware of where the concerns are and then given a real opportunity to change, meaning that the female partner cannot punish him as he stumbles and falls to reach the new, what's the word I'm looking for? The new behavior or the new intervention. Like when Mason, when I made Mason aware that, hey, the, the division of labor isn't equal, it took us another six months to really find a balance that worked for both of us. Yeah. Um, and what I had to do is I had to manage that tendency to be like, you're still not doing enough. You're still not enough. You're still, blah, blah, blah. I'm still doing it all. Rah, 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 rah. It and still so, happens sometimes. Well, yeah. But I'm not human. very often. Right. And so we as women, we need to give our men a safe place where they can feel their emotions, where they can be vulnerable without being shut up. Yeah. where we can talk about job burnout or church burnout, where we can talk to our, our partners about, Hey, I think I need a, a job change, but look at what this is going to do with us financially. Like we need to be able to do that without that panic response. Well, and, and, and educate yourself about why things like that are happening. Like for instance, if in 2004, I had figured that you had an affair simply because you weren't interested in me in, anymore and you wanted to be with him. That that's it. It's over. It's done. Right. We would have had a very different outcome. It, it would have, yeah. We would have probably mm -hmm. divorced and we would have moved on. Right. You're talking about but, getting curious. But when you can recognize that those kind of things happen for other reasons, mm -hmm. and then if you then extrapolate that into pornography, if if you immediately think, well, he's looking at pornography, she's looking at pornography because I don't satisfy her anymore, or she doesn't right. I don't satisfy him anymore. And don't recognize that there are other reasons that happen and you can't talk about it. You're going to end up with an outcome that isn't true to what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. And so if you're getting stuck, if you're finding yourself like when, when your male partner or male friend is expressing vulnerability and, and you find yourself having a reaction rather than an empathetic, validating understanding response or if you find yourself lecturing or problem solving get some help from a licensed qualified professional or mm -hmm. a trained life coach or somebody who can help number one the man speak 
and verbalize their vulnerability and a woman who is safe yeah. to do that with. We, I, they're not going to speak it if they find right, it well, and, safe. And we do see this to varying degrees in, you know, gay, lesbian, trans relationships, but it's, it's, it's a little bit different because there's, there's a, it's just a different dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, you know, I, I want to make sure that it doesn't, it doesn't matter your sexual orientation, your gender identity, if you're struggling with identifying a lack of exposure to the behaviors that you're desiring, you may need help to get there because for the most part, unless a man is in, or a woman, anybody, unless a human is intentionally causing harm, intentionally overlording or practicing undue influence, I, they're not toxic. They are wounded in the sense of not necessarily that they've had something horrible happen to them that they can't talk about because they're nursing or licking a, a wound emotional or otherwise, but they've see this is this is so hard because I don't want to say like they've missed they've missed the messaging, but rather there's been a lack of exposure due to societal norms and in religion that is often complicated because of the reinforcement of unhealthy social norms that have been in existence for eons and eons. Yeah. So if you need help, get help. And as always, if you have any questions or you would like to give us some feedback, you can leave your notes here on the YouTube channel or wherever you're watching this from. Um, or you can email us at daisygirlcommunications at gmail.com. Thanks. We'll see you next time. Unpacking Mormonism and Other Religious Trauma is hosted by Sarah and Mason Westbrook. Produced by Daisy Girl Communications, LLC, and Alex Vidalis. Please join our community on Facebook. Music provided by Musa and John Worthy Music. America. We are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. By honoring your sacred vocation of nursing, you impact your family, your friends, and your community. At Grand Canyon University, our online RN to BSN, MSN, or DNP degree programs allow you to balance online coursework with local in person clinical, practicum, or immersion hours. Find your purpose at GCU. Private, Christian, affordable. Visit gcu.edu. Is your vehicle stopping like it should? Does it squeal or grind when you brake? Don't miss out on summer brake deals at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, oh.